Hey everyone, how are you all going? Here I am talking about this time problem oriented policing for HSP 108. We are going to trot through a few of the basic principles of this particular approach, but ultimately, this, this image on this particular slide here um, shows how. Uh, the type of approach that we're talking about here with a whole bunch of different stakeholders sitting around the table discussing these issues with police so that they can find some way to overcome a specific problem. So let's have a look at this. Problem oriented policing is an approach to policing in which discrete pieces of police business, each consisting of a cluster of similar incidents, whether crime or acts of disorder that the police are expected to handle, a subject to microscopic examination in the hopes that it, what is freshly learned about each problem will lead to discovering a new and more effective strategy to dealing with it. I'm really loving the fact that not <laughs> that police textbooks seem to like really big long sentences. Um, so they have to draw on honed skills of crime analysts and the accumulated experience of operating field personnel in order to you know engage in these types of processes now this definition is actually from the pop center which is an online website entirely dedicated to problem oriented policing and you can see the um, center for problem oriented policing uh, little logo down there in the bottom corner it was introduced in 1979 by Herman Goldstein who said that police needed to focus on the crime or community problem not simply respond to calls uh, and crime events. So this really it was a radical idea, it's a very new idea. The mission of police should not be to solve crime but to focus on the problem as the key event and try and resolve it in that sense. It's not a specific strategy as such because it is more about a diverse range of police practices that fall within things like hotspot policing, situational crime prevention, like the type of things I was talking about in relation to intelligence-led where they put lights into a certain area in order to help prevent crime in that area and, of course, directed patrolling um, in particular. There are some differences between POP and COP. So COP, of course, being community oriented policing. POP focuses on the cause of crime behind the pattern of incidents. And it also focuses on strong, oh, sorry, COP, however, focuses on strong community police partnerships to reduce crime and enhance safety. So POP's not so interested in um, having great relationships with communities. It's part of it, definitely, but not so focused on it. So it's about identifying problems, analysing problems, developing responses and assessing the implementation. It's much more tactical rather than reactive. Resources are better allocated overall, which maximises organisational efficiency. And, of course, that's a freaking great thing. Um, I'll talk more about that in a tick. Uh, it's much more about things like hotspot policing where they can look at crime data and see that there's a certain area where there's a huge amount of crime happening and focus their resources on trying to reduce that. It's more and more taught in police academies. It's a very wide-ranging, uh, widely popular approach to policing. And they, in fact, even have Goldstein Awards now where they give out awards each year for the best problem-oriented approaches. So Eck and Spellman talk about how police organisations should seek to achieve certain things if they're going through this problem-oriented um, problem, um, approach. Number one, total elimination of the identified problem is a key thing. Number two, substantial reduction in the identified problem. Number three, reduction in the harm created by the problem. Number four, development of more effective responses to the problem. Or number five, removal of a problem completely from a police mandate. Um, which is, you know, that's fairly big, that's a fairly big ask in a lot of um, ways, depending on what the issue is. Okay, so one of those things at least should be on their list of things to try and achieve through using this process. 
And there is a specific process that a lot of people elaborate further, and um, Ekin Spellman talk about this in great detail. It's what they called Sarah, or Sarah, however you want to say it. First is scanning, where they define the problem and its attributes, identify the location of it, assess the seriousness and urgency of it, identify people responding, are responsible for the cause um, and uh, the remedy. So they have all of those things in place when they're going through this scanning process. Analysis is the next step where they're analysing the underlying cause that creates and sustains the problem, so the what, the when, the how, the who, all of those types of things, the where. Also, who um, is involved, the nature of the event and incident, the place and time of the incident, um, and, and where it occurs and all of those types of things. So analysis is quite deep in this way. It involves a range of different um, things that they need to be involved with. The response also needs to be innovative. Sometimes you use traditional responses, but you also need to use that in combination with a range of innovative responses. So it might be things like a referral to another agency, mediation processes, uses of, use of um, existing social controls that are already in place, and of course changes to the physical environment like putting in um, lights and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so the responses really can be so incredibly diverse. They can have so many different ways of doing that um, depending on what the circumstances are. An assessment, of course, is evaluating the effectiveness overall. Uh, is if the problem remains, then the cycle process happens again. They start from the beginning and they go through it all, um, all over again. What has POP focused on in the past? Lots and lots of things. Uh, loitering, gun crime, police, uh, sorry, car accidents, um, drug use and abuse, different forms of theft, break and enter, you name it, it has involved these different types of behaviours. Loitering, uh, oh, sorry, I mentioned that, sorry, I meant to say um, begging and, and things like that, as well as murder um, at those higher level, more serious crimes. There are some drawbacks to this approach. Sometimes police can fail to conduct a detailed problem analysis and they implement a rushed response because of that. So, yeah, this is, this is a very common problem because police are often really stretched. Policing organisations are often really stretched with the resources that they have, the police that they have. So they just rush in to this particular issue without doing a proper uh, a problem analysis in the first instance. And that can lead to pretty significant drawbacks if there's stuff that they've overlooked. There is also a tendency for police to rely on traditional or faddish responses rather than conducting a wider search for creative responses. So falling back on things like broken windows approaches or zero tolerance approaches um, to uh, address these things instead of looking at others. There's also a tendency to overlook the assessment for effectiveness, the evaluation processes of the implemented response, and of course to just continue to do those things without going through that process of evaluation. It's absolutely imperative it's evaluated in order to figure out whether it is appropriate and whether it is effective overall. Um, or you could just be making the problems much, much worse. Um, Police leaders often don't have a long-term commitment to problem-oriented policing and, of course, that can lead to many different problematic outcomes uh, when it comes to trying to get people on board. There can be a lack of skilled people to analyse the problems and, of course, evaluate the strategies. You need to have people with research skills to evaluate them. There's a lack of agency and academic uh, collaboration. Often when they're doing problem-oriented approaches, the police will be implementing them, but they'll have an academic who knows about the research evidence base to help inform that and also to help um, conduct the evaluation. And collaboration is essential in that respect. Um, and often there isn't any collaboration. Absence of pressure by public requesting that police use POP is a big problem because if they don't push for that to happen, then the resources won't be 
um, then the resources won't be uh, provided so that that then happens as part of everyday police work. It's sort of the exception rather than the rule. And the public really need to push for that so that it becomes the rule rather than the exception. And, of course, the lack of financial uh, support to implement or maintain uh, these forms of approaches. I'm just going to quickly, very quickly, talk through an example uh, that was put together by Glendale, Arizona Police Department. They looked at crime and disorder at Circle K convenience stores, which was really interesting. There's a whole article that's dedicated to this, but I'm just going to give you a brief summary as opposed to making you read it. So they have, they went through this process of um, SARA in this particular instance, started with scanning where they were looking at crime and disorder around convenience stores, um, chosen because of those crime, the crime data in those areas. The fact that there was a disproportionate allocation of police resources to those areas, there was a lot, to, a lot of threats to the customers and to staff um, in particular and their safety. And the thefts often escalated to violence. So this is a pretty serious problem. The analysis process found that uh, when they looked at the calls for service data, the top 10 convenience store locations were definitely Circle K, which is why they focused specifically on that, um, that brand, I suppose, of convenience store. Circle K made up only 23% of all convenience stores at that particular time, but they constituted 79% calls for service, which is, wow, that's mind-blowing considering they only make up 23% of all convenience stores. They found crime and disorder types typically were property crime, disorder generally, and um, things like welfare checks as well. They were called out there constantly to welfare checks on people hanging out um, outside the store. The analysis of possible reasons for location-specific convenience store crime and disorder calls for service involved looking at the location, so looking at areas where crime is elevated, um, but overall they were found not to be supported by the analysis process. So they went through a site visit process where they looked at management practices, including inadequate staffing, graffiti, violations of crime prevention through environmental design, such as poor lighting, high-risk placement, uh, product placement, um, obstruction in line of sight, loitering, lack of um, response to panhandling, and, um, and so forth. All of these things help them to determine what the problem looked like and how they would respond. So the response that they put together uh, was pretty great. They looked at the crime prevention in terms of environmental design in particular and made a whole bunch of re recommendations to implement uh, from the analysis. Interestingly enough, they were mostly ignored by the uh, management, particularly those requiring significant financial investment. Nonetheless, they gave them those recommendations. There was a partnership developed between police and security officers particularly um, within these organisations and these specific stores. There were meetings with Circle K management but they were often uh, reluctant and eventually sort of lost commitment overall to the project but nonetheless they attempted that. Um, and interestingly enough management managed to re-engage uh, a lot of those people by establishing a working group of Circle K management and other police agencies and they used different forms of public shaming through the media. So if there was a Circle K convenience um, robbery or whatever, they would, you know, get the media to go and target that particular shop, which is not necessarily the best approach but quite effective in this particular case. Um by you know, having a lot of media about the fact that there was a lot of crime and disorder at that shop and that, that then forced the localised management within that shop to actually act and invest some resources in that. They also had a focus on prevention. They put together a youth advisory commission, um, a creation of a public service announcement and a few other things, as well as suppression and looking at intensive enforcement and surveillance in those um, particular areas. That's probably the stuff that has a significant impact if the local community does not like police in the first instance. So that's very important to bear that in mind. 
Overall though, they found a 42% reduction in calls for service, a cost saving of $40,000 in police officer time because of the reduced calls for service and community and employee safety overall was significantly enhanced. So it's clearly been a very effective process, which is why they published a whole journal article on it and because it was pretty, it was pretty great. But hopefully that just gives you a sense of um, what problem oriented policing is about and how they do it and all of those types of things. And on that note, I am done for now. Again, it was good to chat with you all and I shall see you very soon. See ya!